And you can hear everything. <laughs> Oh, it's counting down. Oh, no, I think we are live. Come on in. Oh, okay. Grab a hand on. Yeah. Well, I want to welcome everybody tonight. Thank you so much for joining us for our March Garden Guru. Donna is here again. She's a volunteer from the Master Gardeners of Wood County. Um, tonight we'll be discussing tools in tool care, and she brought lots of examples along to share with us. Um, I just want to thank Donna so much for always being willing to teach us new and exciting things about gardening. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and raise your hand or just kind of shout them out. Donna likes to answer them as she goes during the program, so you can nicely interrupt her. <laughs> and same with the ones that are watching online. Um, you can type a question into the chat and I'll ask it for you so we can answer them live too. Um, so let's see. Otherwise, that's all we have. So thank you so much for joining us and I'll give the stage to Donna. Okay. Tonight, um, well, I should introduce myself. I'm Donna Strife. I'm a Wood County Master Gardener volunteer. Um, and I'm doing this as part of our education program, outreach to people in the community. Um, we are a part of UW Extension, and that's their main goal is to provide information to people all over the state of Wisconsin. It's called the Wisconsin Idea. Um, our program tonight is Garden Tools, Selection and Care. And if you've ever gone to um, some place, especially if you're a new gardener and you're looking at a wall of tools like this and you'll say, okay, I'm not going to buy one of every one of those. Which ones do I really need? So we're going to talk a little bit uh, tonight about the, the ones you probably will use most often as a gardener. Um, there's many more little gadgety kind of things that you can get too, but um, I'm going to show you some of the basic ones that work pretty good for just about all gardening tasks. Um, when you're buying tools, um, some general guidelines, buy the best quality you can afford. Okay, so if, can you, if you can afford um, a good quality tool, it's going to last you much longer um, and it's, it's going to hold up and you won't have to buy a replacement as often. Um, on the other hand, if you can only afford a tool that's le less expensive, sometimes they're not bad. I can't even remember where I got this one. Um, I think it's uh, from Hardware Hank. I can see the NK on here yet, but this is one that I use all the time. And, um, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be expensive, but you want to look for some quality things. How is the head, this part here, attached to the handle? And it should be secure. Um, a lot of times in some tools, there's a bolt through here or this handle goes, this um, bottom part of the head goes all the way through the handle. That's a more secure thing than if something's just stuck in there. Um, wood or fiberglass handles are probably the best. Wood um, absorbs more, um, like when you're digging, more of the force. Mm -hmm. Um, the fiberglass ones usually are easier to care for because they have a smooth surface. Um, the ones that, and then some of them even come with um, like a padding on them or a grip. So, you know, it's, it all depends. It's up to you what kind you want. Um, look for steel heads and, and really good solid heads. Like you can see, this one is quite thick. Um, if you're going to you have a long handle, and I didn't bring any of my long handle tools just because it's too much to bring, but having a D-shaped handle on it um, gives you better control over that tool because you have a handle that you're actually hanging on to rather than just the, the um, shaft of the, the long handle tool. And then handle length, and that's determined um, by your size. Um, a short person like me, I've got a pitchfork that has about three feet more handle than I need on it because every time I want to use it to turn my compost pile, it bumps into the garden shed behind me. So um, 
you know, you kind of have to look and see. There are tools that are built for women um, and smaller people. So, you know, take that into consideration too when you're buying a tool. You know, how long does the handle, want, do, you, do you want it to be? Then when you're buying it, hold it and hold it and hang on to it and see what does it feel like. This one, uh, compare it. Okay, this one has a nice grippy handle and you think, oh, well, that would be really good. But I found that it's too long from where my hand is to up here. That That's too much work. Um, I don't know, in yoga, they say shorten the lever, you know, don't have it so far from your, from your force. Um, this one, I can come up here, I can even go like this on this. And oftentimes I do when I want to be doing some very close cultivating or something like that. So I don't have to have my hand back here. So it all depends on, you know, how, how you're going to use the tool, um, how you want to grip it. Um, so what I'm saying is try it out, you know, see, does it feel right when, when you're going to use it? Um, <clears throat> let's see. If you have a tool that's the right length and the right size, um, that's going to make it easier to use, easier on your body, um, not going to tire you out as fast. Okay. Um, oops, I'm going backwards this way. Okay. First category of tools we're going to look at are cultivation tools. And these are things you use for digging in the ground. Um, first one is some kind of a trowel. I've got three different kinds here. My trusty old one that's actually getting kind of rusty. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes a trowel will come with, uh, where's my camera here, with markings on it. So if you want to be digging a hole and you want to plant bulbs, let's say three inches deep, you have some idea of how deep the hole is. Um, sometimes, you know, it comes that way. Um, this is a pretty good attachment here. You can see that this goes in and it's, it goes all the way down the handle. This one here is another one that's with a pretty good attachment and you want it, this to be really sturdy. Um, the next one is a hand cultivator, and this would be used for um, cultivating between plants, let's say in your garden, if you want to be weeding or just loosening the soil. Um, and again, I have the two different kinds here. Oh, there we go, so that we showed earlier. Um, and you know the tine length doesn't make a lot of difference, but again, hold it and feel, how does it feel? Um, then you get into some of the bigger tools like the um, garden rake over there, also called a bow rake, which is different than of course a leaf rake because that has a fan shaped end on it. Um, down here we have a round point shovel, sometimes called a sand shovel too. Um, and that's a pretty easy one to use for gardening for lots of different tasks. If you are um, shoveling a lot of things like loose compost or something like that, you might want to have a flathead shovel, but this one would work, the round ended one would work also in that case. And then um, another thing that comes handy when you're dividing things um, or planting, digging planting holes, some people might add a spade. And there you can see the D-shaped handles I talked about earlier on the those last two tools in the bottom row. So um, again, you want to make sure that the attachment, the head is attached to the handle and wooden and fiberglass handles are probably the easiest ones to work with. Okay, the next category is weeding tools. And I've got a couple different weeders here. And again, this one was supposed to be an ergonomically designed, whoop, where we go, er ergonomically designed weeder, but I find that it's a little more clumsy. I keep going back to these. <laughs> Let's see, I'm getting like, these two here. And you can tell this one's had a lot of wear. My dog mm -hmm. even liked to chew on it at one time. So sometimes another hint, you might wanna look for something that has a bright color. Um, mm -hmm. Orange blends in. It's good in the growing season, but in the fall, it blends in with a lot of other stuff. Green um, stands out a little bit better in the fall, but again, if you lose it in the garden or are looking for it, it's a little harder to find during the growing season. So you might try red or pink maybe or something like that. Um, 
And some people I know actually put some paint on handles of their tools so that they can find them more easily. Okay, um, and then we have hand cultivators, like you see the one in the picture right here, the middle top picture. Um, and those are sometimes called cobra head. They can be used for cultivating and for weeding. Um, you can get them with wide blades or very narrow blades. Um, again, they do pretty much what this one does, but it's a little, it's held a little bit differently and used a little bit differently. Then we have the regular garden hoe on the end of the top row, which is familiar to most people. But there are also other different kinds of hoe ends that you can have. The lower left one here is called a stirrup hoe. And this works well for light soils, like sandy type soils, and you just work it back and forth. Um, and that cuts off the weeds just under the surface or at the surface. Um, this one is called a collinear hoe. And again, that's a wide blade, but very narrow blade. And again, that's used more. You just kind of scrape right underneath the soil surface to, to loosen the weeds. Um, and then you have a wire hoe and you have one that looks like this um, one up here, except it's on a long handle. And you have also pointed hoes. Those are sometimes used for like drawing lines when you're planting seeds for rows of seeds. But I mean, you, you only need one, you know, choose one. And you can always go to other ones if you want to expand your collection of gardening tools. So um, the next category is pruning tools. And we have a couple different kinds here. Pruners come in many different um, sizes. Again, this is a tool where you really want to try your hand on it. Um, there's actually ways to measure how wide your grip is or what kind of tool. Oh, come on here. There we go. Um, depending on how wide your hand is, you want something that you can easily grasp. If this was another half an inch wider or so, this would be really hard for me to get my hand around it. So again, check how wide does it open um, when you um, use it? How easy is it to use? There are even um, pruners that have like ratcheting kinds of things that you can put more force on with less force on your hand. So it kind of works like gears to, to increase the force. Then there's also some other things about pruners. This is a bypass pruner. It has two blades and they go past each other like a scissors. I'm not doing this very well. There we go. You know, they go past each other like a scissors. Um, they make the sharpest cuts. And a lot of people prefer this one because it doesn't leave a ragged edge on the plant. Then the other kind is called a bypass pruner. And this has a flat uh, let's see, where are we here? A flat piece here. This isn't a blade at all and just the one blade and that comes down on this and kind of crushes the stem or the branch. So um, you probably wanna, wouldn't want to use something like this for cutting flowers because then you have that ragged edge on the stem and that wouldn't absorb water as well. Um, you can get them in really small sizes like this one. Yep, here we go. Um, and this would be used like for um, deadheading flowers, um, or it could be used for um, picking herbs, um, th those kinds of things where you wanna get really in close and um, be very precise in what you cut off. So we'll put the cover back on that one. What is that one called? It's just a pruner, just a pruner. Okay. but it's a small one. So you I can like get them in lots of different sizes. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Okay, then when we get bigger than you can handle with that, those are up to maybe maybe an inch. Um, then we go to what's called a lopper. And this is an example of a lopper. Um, my husband just got me this one for Christmas because <laughs> my other one bit the dust. Um, these two, you can get them with... Um, like gears and stuff that increase the the amount of and this one has telescoping handles so i can store it in a much smaller space but i can still reach pr pretty far in fact we had a big branch come down and he got good use out of it already 
before I even got to use it. Yeah, yeah, I said to him today, where's my lopper? So we'll put that one away. Then if you exceed about two inches of something you want to prune, then you have to go one step further and you need a pruning saw. And um, this, is, this one is um, a folding saw. Okay, so, um, where are we here? Folding saw, so you can see it, it would store much in a much smaller space and the blade is covered when it's stored. So um, that's a safety feature also. But you can also get them that look like this, but do not fold. And then you can get uh, many other kinds of saws, bow saws and you know all kinds of other things. Um, and all the way up to chainsaws if you're using a really big pruning job like one basal cut. Um, and let's see, um, the other one I have on this picture is um, what's called a hedge trimmer or hedge clipper. And if you don't have hedges, you obviously don't need that. But if you do, it it's, provides a nice flat cut so that you can cut a lot of branches at one time and keep it nice and even and flat. Um, other tools, my titles seem to be squished in with everything else. Um, some other things that come in handy, not necessarily that you have to have them right away. This is called a garden knife or a hori hori knife. And it's got two really sharp edges. One is straight and one is serrated. It also has the markings on it, again, inches. So if you're digging, this one can um, cut open bags of mulch. It can divide plants. It can you know, be used to plant things. It can be used to um, separate stuff. Um, it's, it's just a handy tool. If you get it, get the sheath to go with it because it's very sharp and you wouldn't want that um, just hanging around in your bucket, in your tool bucket. A hori hori knife, H-O-R-I, H-O-R-I. Sounds like it does it all. It kind of is uh, <laughs> an all around garden tool. Yeah. Some other things I found to helpful to have, a kneeling pad of some kind. Um, and you wanna kind of look and see, do you like square ones, round ones? Um, I kind of like this oblong one because it's got room for both knees and some in there. Um, so that's, that's another helpful thing to have. Um, I found that if you're gonna be doing things like turning compost or um, moving straw, like for mulch or something, a pitchfork comes in handy or, or a garden fork, one of the two. Um, a leaf rake for lawn, lawn work, a uh, grass clipper, which I have in my hand here. Um, and then all the way up, of course, to your lawn mower of some kind. Um, stringer twine and a scissors are come in handy a lot because a lot of times you have to tie up plants and you know other things. And a scissors, because if you're cutting twine, you're cutting uh, mulch bags open, um, you want to snip off a little bit of a plant here or there. Um, it comes in handy. Um, a ruler of some kind, um, because when you're spacing plants, it's just you don't have to run back in the house and get a ruler or a yardstick or something. Um, and the fold up ones work good again because you can store it in a small space. Um, if you're really getting into gardening, you might look at a garden cart or a wheelbarrow um, if you're hauling things around. I found that tarps work pretty good for that too. Um, you just put it all on top of the tarp and grab a hold of it and pull it where you want it to go. And then you can just lift it up and dump it. So um, that, that will be helpful also. And then you should have probably some place where you're gonna store these tools and you can hang them on a wall in your shed. But I found that if you have, this is just a carpenter's, um, tool thing and just put it over a pail with or without a bottom. <laughs> is that the, like the apron that goes for them? Nope, nope. This is made to be put on a bucket of some kind. So that's called a carpenter? Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's, 
This one says bucket boss, but um, that's a good place to start. You just just go to like a hardware store and tell them you want a a bucket tool holder. Yeah, that's lovely. And so, and I mean, other people have used like baskets or tote kind of things. This one I like because I can take all of these things and stick them in these pockets, and they're not all in a big jumble in the bottom of the the um, the pail or whatever. You could use a plain old pail too. But, uh, but you might be digging as much and fishing around for it. Too. Right, right. Exactly. And it it hold it holds up pretty well too. Yeah. Is it does it wash well? Or? Yeah, yeah. I hand wash it. Oh, okay. By the end of this, you know, you probably end up with dirt in it. I tip the whole thing upside down and shake the dirt out and then just wash it in a, a sink of soapy water. Let it hang up and dry. Takes a little while, all those pockets to get. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sure. Another handy thing to have is a pencil to mm -hmm. make notes and things. Um, now we're going to move into how to take care of tools. Um, most important thing is day-to-day -day things is to clean the soil from the tools at the end of the day. Um, the more soil you leave on them, especially wet soil, it gets caked on there, then it starts to rust. And then the next time you use it, you're trying to dig with this tool with this caked on dirt on it, and it just doesn't work very well. It's very inefficient. You get tired much faster. Um, if the tool is washed off, be sure you dry it before storing. You can just let it sit in the sun for a few minutes to dry, or you know, if you wanna have a towel or whatever to dry it, but um, store your tools out of the weather. So in other words, don't leave them laying in the garden, um, in the garage, in a shed, um, in a basement, whatever. Um, sharpen tools as needed to make the gardening easier on you. The sharper the tool, just like in the kitchen, the sharper the knife, the better it works. And um, account for all tools so that you don't leave them in the garden. <laughs> and sometimes you leave them over the winter because <laughs> you can't remember where you last used it. Um, tighten any loose parts, nuts and bolts. Um, some of these do have parts that you can tighten. This one has some nuts and bolts on it and a uh, lopper and um, other tools. And then return them to the storage area. Um, when you're using tools, it's also important to disinfect them, um, especially if you're doing pruning and you are pruning diseased parts off of plants. Um, you don't wanna carry that disease from one plant to another or even from one part of a plant to another part so um, when you're disinfecting tools, first you clean with soap and water so that there's no dirt on them because it's hard to disinfect dirt. Um, what type of soap would you recommend? Um, for disinfecting or for cleaning? For cleaning. Dish soap? Just any kind. Yeah, okay. dish soap. Um, a, and use a use a str ugh, strong spray of water to dislodge soil if you have um, some tight spaces like some of these pruning tools. You know, it's hard to get into all the cracks and crevices. Um, and then you can also use a brush too if you really have to um, get into places and get the dirt out. Um, pitch and sap um, can be removed with turpentine or another solvent. Um, and then once you have the tool completely clean, then you go about disinfecting it. And we're gonna talk about each one of those three ways. You can either use bleach, alcohol, or a spray disinfection, disinfectant. Um, whatever you do, read and follow all the label directions and cautions and use safety goggles and rubber gloves when disinfecting tools if that's directed um, and keep disinfectants in a safe place out of the reach of pets and children, of course. So bleach solution, um, we said clean the tool first. You want to use five and a quarter percent sodium hypochlorite bleach, which is your regular laundry bleach. Now bleach is coming in more than one strength these days. So look on the bottle and see that it is at the five and a quarter percent um, chlorine. Um, you dilute one part bleach with nine parts of water in a plastic container. You don't want to use metal. 
uh, plastic or enamel. Um, and then you dunk the tool in it, submerge it for at least 30 seconds. Or you can also spray the tool with a solution. That gets kind of messy though. You're better off probably dunking. Um, don't add any other chemicals to the dip. And be aware that bleach will harm fabrics that it touches. So you wanna be wearing some protective clothing or old clothing that you don't care if it's going to get stained. Um, the disadvantage, that's a disadvantage is that it will harm fabric that it touches. The other one is it will pit the metal and cause it to rust more easily. So that's one thing to keep in mind. So um, as far as using it on plastic, plastic parts of tools, that's probably okay, but um, it's gonna be hard on the metal parts. Then when you're done um, dipping it, you rinse it well and dry thoroughly and apply a rust inhibitor like WD-40 or some other um, rust inhibitor. And then pour this bleach solution down the sink and not in your garden. So it'll probably kill the plants. Okay, if you're gonna use rubbing alcohol, again, you start with a clean tool and you use 70% rubbing alcohol. And alcohol, again, comes in different percents also. So you want the 70%. Um, don't dilute it. So you put it in a container and then you dip or spray the tool with that full strength alcohol and allow it to air dry. <clears throat> um, some cautions with this. Um, alcohol is very flammable. So don't smoke or have any other open flame in the area when you're doing this. Ventilate well or do it outside away from any um, flame sources. Um, it's not corrosive like bleach, but it is very flammable. Um, it's easier to use in the field when pruning, either have a wet rag with the alcohol um, on it or a spray bottle of alcohol. Um, some people also have uh, just have a container with the alcohol in it and then they have two pruning tools. They put one in the alcohol, prune with the other one, then switch. Put the, put the pruning tool in the alcohol and take the other one out and use it to prune. Um, and that, that works a little bit better than with the um, bleach where you have, have to have a pretty good quantity of it. The third one is to use a dising, disinfecting spray, okay? Um, and check the label. It should have one-tenth of 1% 1 alkyl, alkyl dimethyl benzyl ammonium saccharinate. That's a mouthful. But what that is, is the chemical that's in Lysol. So... Um, and that's just one brand name as an example. So you know kind of what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and again, you start with a clean tool. So if you've been pruning and it's all full of sap and everything, you have to clean that off and then spray the tool and it has to stay wet for two minutes and then you can let it air dry after that. And I know some people that prune with a can of Lysol stuck in their back pocket while they're pruning. <laughs> And again, you know, you use one tool, you spray it, and you use the other tool. And by the time that's two minutes are up, then you go back and use the first tool again. So it's one way to do it. If you don't want to be slowed down too much. Um, and that's, that's probably one of the easier ones to do because you don't have to mix anything and, and everything. Um, removing rust from tools. Okay, now you got your tool, it's all rusty. Um, the thing we use for that is kitchen vinegar, full strength. And you fill a container that's deep enough to submerge the metal part of the tool and just let it in there for several hours or overnight. <clears throat> and rinse it under running water then um, and pat dry. If it still has 
a little rust on it, you can use steel wool or a, a wire brush to remove the rest of the rust. A lot of times after you've removed rust from tools, they need to be sharpened. So that may be a possibility. And then uh, apply a rust inhibitor, like a lightweight oil, not a motor oil, um, WD-40, a silicone spray, something that's going to coat that metal so that it doesn't rust again as easily. <clears throat> okay, wood handle tools. Um, wood does kind of wear the surface on it. Um, and sometimes it gets splintered. So if your tool is starting to splinter, you want to um, sand that with some sandpaper um, or steel wool and um, smooth away the slivers of wood. And then boiled linseed oil is a good um, protectant or preservative to put on there. And it keeps it from hand uh, drying out. The other thing you can do is remove all of the finish and repaint it or put another finish on it, whether you want to put polyurethane or varnish or whatever on it. Or you can use a rubber coating spray and that can improve the grip too if you're having trouble holding on to the tool. Um, one thing that's very, very important to know is linseed oil is very flammable and um, an oil soaked rag can do uh, spontaneous combustion. So if you've used linseed oil, store the rags in a container filled with water and then follow the instructions on the back of the, the can as to how to dispose of that afterwards. But if you just leave it somewhere, it could start on a fire all by itself. So who knew taking care of tools was so dangerous? <laughs> Now we're gonna to get to the dangerous part too. Um, sharpening tools. Um, when you're sharpening tools, always use safety glasses and leather gloves when you're sharpening um, because you're gonna be using, you're gonna be working on sharp edges and you're gonna be using um, things like files and that that are pretty tough on your hands. Um, always also use a vise to hold the tool securely while you're working on it, which is why I didn't bring, <laughs> I'm not going to actually demonstrate for you how to sharpen a tool because I don't have a vise here. Um, you can either sharpen into the cutting edge or away from the cutting edge, and it doesn't really make much difference which way. Um, but if you're cutting into the edge, it produces a sharper edge, but it's also a greater risk of cutting yourself when you're doing it because you're, you're sharpening into, so here's the edge, you're sharpening into the edge. So if you slip or whatever, you could very easily, you know, cut yourself from the edge of the tool. Um, face the sharp edge away from you when you're um, going to do this and stroke down the slope across the cutting edge. It's going to make a rough, edge on the back and if you run your hand against the, the front edge will be sharp and right along the edge you'll feel what are called burrs and you just take your file and go on the back side and smooth off the burrs then i have a picture here and this maybe go to that picture okay so here you have the the um tool held in the the vise here this is the cutting edge um, it was a suggestion and something I read of marking this cutting edge like with a magic marker. And then when you're sharpening it, you want to sharpen that whole edge. So you want to take off all of the magic marker along that edge so you know that you've hit the whole edge. But this person would start at this end and the file would be moving in this direction. It would be going both this way and this way. So along the edge of the tool as well as this way. It's kind of a diagonal diagonal push with the file, if that makes more sense here. Um, you want to try and keep the original angle, whatever that is, and that marker will help you to notice that too. If you're filing too short on one side, you got half the marker edge gone all the way along the tool and you're not getting the other half. Um, if you make it too blunt, the blade will not cut very well. And if you make it really, really sharp, it's going to wear prematurely. So it takes a little bit of skill to do this. Um, and 
each tool is sharpened a little bit differently too, depending on its use. Um, so, uh, talked about that. Um, shovels and hose, you would use a 10 inch mill file and only cut in a forward stroke. Do not apply, so you're only, you're only moving it away. You're not coming back with pressure on the thing. You just move it away, lift it up and come back, move it away, lift it up and come back. Um, <clears throat> let's see. I tried to show you that in the picture. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> you have any questions about that? Okay, loppers, pruning shears, and hedge shears. Um, you have cutting edges on them. Like this one has two cutting edges. This one has only one. Um, let's see. The loppers has two. And again, you have to you have to do each um, edge separately. Um, um, if an anvil has nicks or scratches, the anvil, remember, um, was that flat edge on this tool here. Um, that that can also be. That can also be removed with a, a file to a three corner file. Some people just say, oh, all this sharpening stuff, I'll just take it by somebody who sharpens this and knows what they're doing. <laughs> Head shears should be sharpened to their original factory angle. They have a special angle on them. Those are tricky to do yourself. Um, they also have a squared tip and that has to be um, bent so that it meets. Otherwise, it, the blades kind of go past each other if the, the tips don't meet exactly right. Um, saws typically are not sharpened. Um, usually you get a replacement blade instead. Um, and when sharpening any saw, a cross-cut file with a rounded edge or a triangular file will be needed. Um, and the size of the file has to match the size of the teeth on the saw. So it's, it's kind of a specific thing. Um, grass cutting tools. Um, again, usually grass sears are made of really hard metal and um, it's better to have that professionally um, done because it's easy to get these so they don't um, match when they come together. If they don't match all the way, you're not going to be able to cut all the way. And so in summary, buy the best quality tools you can afford at the time. Consider your body size and your hand size when choosing tools. Um, take good daily care of tools. Sharpen and repair as needed. Store out of the weather. Use safety glasses and gloves as needed when you're um, taking care of your tools, read labels and follow exactly um, when disinfecting tools and use tools as intended to avoid injury and increase your tool life. So if you use a tool like a lopper and you're trying to cut too big a branch, you're just going to ruin your lopper and you're not going to get the branch cut anyway, probably. So um, using tools as they're intended, that's why we have different kinds of tools for different, different jobs. So with that, um, I always include this every time I give a speech. Um, if you're looking for information and the way I gathered the information on the resource list you have, um, you can go on to the internet in a, a web browser and add the word extension or site, dot, site colon dot edu after your um, question. So this would be like disinfecting garden tools extension or disinfecting garden tools site colon dot edu. Um, what that does is narrow down the list of things you're going to get back for you know the answers to your question to um, sites from extension offices, universities, um, education groups. Um, and those are usually researched information. 
So if you just put in disinfecting garden tools, you could get anybody out there who's got a blog on disinfecting garden tools and may not know a thing about doing it, but they've got this blog out there, you know, and um, we did this um, in a training I had and we said, um, painting um, after pruning trees and we didn't put anything else in. And we got all kinds of sites for paint companies and everything else and nothing about should you paint a, a tree after you've pruned off a branch? Um, but if you go this way, then you'll get the information about whether or not you should paint it in the first place. And if so, under what circumstances and what kind of paint should you use? So um, then if you have gardening questions, choose a, a source that's either Wisconsin, like the UW, uh, UW Extension, um, or if we don't get anything from Wisconsin, then a state nearby like Minnesota, Illinois, Iowa, um, the Dakotas. So you want something that has a climate kind of like ours. Michigan would be another one. If you get something about um, pruning apple trees and it's coming from Arizona, um, that wouldn't be of much help here because, you know, I don't even think they grow apples in Arizona. But, you know, it's probably telling you how to do that some special way under the climate conditions they have there, which means nothing in Wisconsin. And you can use this for any type of questions, like if you want to find out things about canning, for example, or you want to find out things about, um, I don't know, financial planning. You know, I mean, there's just hundreds of different topics that you can go on and use that clue, and that will bring you... Um, you researched and tested and tried and true um, solutions to your problem. So, any questions? Do you know someone around here that sharpens tools? Um, I believe a lot of times hardware stores will. And if they don't do it there, they can probably tell you who does because they probably get a lot of inquiries. Um, that would be my first, my first guess. My dad would use a whetstone. A whetstone is a flat yeah. piece. Um, they're usually used more often like for knives because you, you do the same kind of motion, but you're using the knife on the stone and, you, you know, when you're sharpening a knife. Um, whereas a tool, it's kind of hard to get that flat stone to go along the edge of here. Yeah. My grandpa also used the old... Um, oh, a grinding wheel yes, kind of he thing? Did. And he'd get out there with the axe. And, yep, yep. And remember the sparks would fly. And, mm -hmm. yep. yep, yep. And in the case of an axe, that's the kind of thing you would have to use because, you know, using doing it by hand would be quite, it's kind of tedious. So I come from old, old time. Gardeners. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? Do we have any questions from our audience? No, no. Can we get a copy of this slide, the slide presentation? Um, you can, it's on the um, library website, YouTube, YouTube page, I should say, the library's YouTube page. I think I have a printed too, yeah, because you can watch it again there, and then you can stop it if you want to, you know, write down something more. I know I covered a lot of information, and yeah, you guys were were writing furiously, and you might not have still caught all of it. So, but that's a good way. The, the Everett Rail Memorial Library YouTube page. library okay yeah. if you just start, type that name in on youtube otherwise if you just go to our website and click on the youtube icon on the upper right it takes you directly to our youtube page okay, okay. okay. and then i always file them under like which program it is so you can just click on the garden guru and all the past garden guru programs okay. will be listed there too oh, yep wonderful. there's getting to be quite a slew yeah yeah yeah, I think there was over 20. Sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. We have to amend them. we got to do something. 
<laughs> I can't even spell today. Oh, it's wrong. There we go. Yeah. Okay, anything else? Very informative. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, this is what I'll do if I'm waiting for my plants to spread. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Next month, the topic is planting and planting your garden. And it's on April 10th. Is that right? <clears throat> Yeah, because it's a week earlier yeah. than we usually yeah, go. So Easter Monday. So Easter yeah. Monday. Mm -hmm. So that was the tip. So on that one, we'll be talking about picking up plants at like a garden center or planting your seedlings that you started, your young plants, um, how to plan, where to put them in the garden, how to rotate the garden crops, um, all those kinds of things. In my garden, it's going to be interesting. I had to cut down five diseased trees. So I had a significant canopy. So now I've got to get my brain. So you've gone from having full shade to full sun. The shade veg garden. Now I've got probably 50% full sun and 50% shade. Yeah. So the brain's got to change how it's thinking. Yeah. So I, need, I need this next class. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a different world for me. <laughs> yeah, that, that makes a big difference when you yes. lose trees. Also, after a number of years, trees grow and they start shading areas that used to be sunny too. Yes. So, um, I'm over 200 years old. We cut down one ash tree that I would see the squirrels kind of go up and I thought, they go up through it, and sure enough, the um, arborist came, and he was going through with this with the chainsaw to get all the you know canopy on. And he says it went through like butter. He says it scared him half to death. It was absolutely hollow oh. all the way through. Oh. And sadly, my trees are over, well over two hundred years old. So yeah, some of them have outlived their their life. Yeah, yeah. they're dangerous right now. So like, yeah, I'm just breaking my heart. With five trees. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, five big it. trees. Yeah. yeah, but it had to be okay. So yeah, next next uh, next month will be something good for me. Okay, all of these have been wonderful. Thank yeah. you very much. Okay, well, I'll be happy to see you again next month, hopefully. Just pick your brain. Okay. <laughs> yep. That's what I do.